Hey everyone, happy Wednesday. I'm Alex and I'll be covering today's Wednesday widget. Today I'll be machining this cool Wankel inspired fidget spinner. It's composed of three main parts, the body, the eccentric shaft, and of course, the rotor. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. Card here to where it all started with our V8 LS3 engine block project we did a few weeks back. From there, due to both community outcry and our own wants, we decided we were gonna step it up a little bit and make a functional engine. The problem with doing this on a piston engine is you have way more moving parts, including things like valves, and you have to worry about the timing on those valves, and it's all very intricate and very difficult to get right the first try. What made the rotary engine so revolutionary was that it only uses really two main moving parts. You have the rotor and you have the eccentric shaft. Now, we definitely aren't gonna write a piston engine off of the table. It's definitely something we'd like to get into later, but we've gotta start somewhere, so may as well start with a rotary that's a little bit simpler. One of the biggest design challenges with making a Wankel engine is creating the shape of the inner housing and the shape of the rotor. The shape of the housing is a shape called an epitrochoid, and the shape of the rotor is similar to, but not exactly the same as a rouleau triangle. The fidget spinner is a perfect project for this. It's gonna allow me to learn how to create these shapes when we go on to our final design. So let's jump right into machining and be sure you stay tuned because there is certainly more rotary engine content coming down the road. We're using a piece of aluminum round bar as the stock for our body and card here to our video on the lathe chuck subplate, which completely eliminates the need for these strap clamps. After indicating, we're gonna throw in our favorite quarter inch flat end mill, doing an adaptive running at 2,000 feet per tooth, 10,000 RPM, a quarter inch depth of cut, and 50 thou width of cut. With the posts of the strap clamps sticking up like they are, I was a little hesitant to use bigger tools like the Superfly and the Shear Hog. So that's why I started with this quarter inch tool, and you'll see when I come in to do this face, we're gonna do a cool pattern across the top with this quarter inch end mill. To do this, I'm using a 2D contour in the shape of the rotor, and I'm just using roughing passes to step that out and make it grow larger over the face. So this is gonna give us a cool visual pattern that's shaped like the rotor on the inside. Next up is Tormox diamond tipped engraver, and we're gonna engrave the logo, and then come back over it with that same facing operation to get rid of the burr that it raises. Now I'm using the same tool to cut a couple slots, and these both look very aesthetically pleasing, but they do serve a really good purpose for our last stop on this part. Right here, we're using a telescoping gauge just to check this diameter before I take it out of the chuck so I don't have to re-indicate in case I need to bring that bore out to fit our bearing. Now I prefer not to crash into the chuck, so I need my part to sit a little bit off of the bottom edge of the three chuck posts. So to do this, I just took two parallels, I stacked them on top of each other, and I used some of our powder coating tape that we actually use for our super glue trick, and I ran it across the bottom so we don't mar up that nice surface we gave it on the last stop. After indicating, we'll go back to our quarter inch end mill, and we're using the same recipe as before to take out this material. The reason I'm using this tool as opposed to the shear hog, because there is a decent amount of material to be removed, is because the part is sitting a little bit lower than it was on our last op, and those three posts of the lathe chuck are a little bit closer, and as are the toes of all three strap clamps. And instead of using a horizontal toolpath to finish up the bottom, we use that exact same 2D contour as we did the last time to give it that cool triangular rotor shape. Gonna switch out tool 31 for a smaller 3 16 ball end mill. And this is just gonna put a little bit of a pattern on that finger post and give it a little bit more grip. So to see how to do this cool diamond pattern, be sure to check out our video on 3D surfacing where I walk through how to make this pattern. I'm starting to like this quarter inch chamfer mill less and less. And Ed uses one that he likes a lot. I'm thinking about 
trying it and using it a lot more. The problem I'm having with this is after you use it, that perfect point on the bottom starts to wear down. So every time you measure your tool height, the tool is shorter and shorter, meaning that you aren't gonna get an accurate chamfer dimension. So what happened on this part is it wasn't quite long enough and it left a little flat spot and a little lip at the end of the chamfer. Anyway, I cut it, I realized there's no quick and easy way to get this part done in just two ops. For the third op, I use this quick fixture and the top of the fixture just matches and mates with the inside of the housing. So it's that epitrochoid shape. And those four screws you see on top screw into the slots we cut on our first op. And that's just gonna hold it in place. It doesn't need to be anything crazy strong because all we're doing is a chamfer and I need it clocked in one certain direction. Had I tried to do this chamfering in the last op, it would not have worked because I didn't clock the part, which in this case is faster for a one-off part However, if I were making a production run of these, we'd want a way to hold it in our second op so that we could finish this part in only two ops. Finally, for the body, we're gonna move over to the arbor press and press the bearing in. And thankfully, that dimension I measured earlier with the telescoping gauge was spot on. So this worked perfectly. Moving on, our next part is the rotor. And I did this out of Delrin because I wanted a little more contrast in the part. It wouldn't have been quite as cool looking if everything were made out of aluminum. Now I haven't used Delrin a whole lot, but I did learn a couple important things here. You wanna be moving fast enough that you're not just melting the plastic as the tool moves through it, because that'll gum up your tool and it'll leave a really bad burr and just melted plastic everywhere. But you also don't wanna be moving so fast that the tool is tearing the plastic because this will leave a bad surface finish and it'll leave you with more to deburr. For the most part, you can get away with running aluminum speeds and feeds in Delrin. You may be left with a little bit of a burr in some places, but it can definitely go faster. The other thing I did here was increase my ramp angle from two degrees to four degrees because I was getting some chatter when I hit the Delrin originally. So for the adaptive here, I took our standard aluminum recipe with this tool and I multiplied our feed per tooth by two. So we're running it at 10,000 RPM, 4,000 feed per tooth, 50,000 width of cut, and I also multiply the depth of cut by two, so we're cutting at a half inch depth of cut. And I'm gonna finish this part using tabs, and this didn't work out perfectly, but be sure to check out our Modvice tolerance gauge video for a more in-depth explanation of how I do this. Last but not least, we have the eccentric shaft, and I'm just gonna come in with our quarter inch end mill and use our standard recipe to rough the shape out. If you haven't noticed already, I'm kind of a big fan of this knurling operation that we do. So I'm gonna go back to our 3 16 ball end mill, and I'm gonna mill a little knurl in this dimple here. And that's where your finger's gonna go. It's gonna give you a little more grip to turn the spinner. Ed showed off this trick a little while ago, but when indicating I couldn't quite get to the X axis because of that overhang. So I took a gauge block and I held it up underneath and then I could measure to the end of the gauge block and subtract the length to get my X axis dimension. And everything on op two is basically the same as op one. The only difference being we're putting a post on this side that's going to fit inside of the bearing instead of that dimple.
Now let's talk about how exactly I created these shapes. So for the epitrochoid, I use a really cool graphing tool called Desmos. And this is great if you're a student and you don't have your TI-84 lying around, but they also have a great built-in epitrochoid function that I'm gonna use a lot. Now an epitrochoid is composed of three main parts. You have a point that rests a set distance from the center of a circle. And in Desmos, this variable name is D. That circle your point is attached to, its radius dimensions variable is lowercase r, and then that smaller circle is going to roll around another circle and that larger circle's radius variable is capital R. So what's going to happen is the smaller circle is going to roll around the larger circle and that point is going to trace a line that follows its path. Now here you can see there are sort of three lobes of the shape and we only need two for the shape we need. So for a rotary engine, each of these variables has to be sequentially half of the one that comes before it. I like to set little r to r divided by two and d to little r divided by two. And this way I can change the big r variable and that will change the other variables to be exactly what I need them to be. Now, if we go up in the top left corner, we'll see this A variable. And this is what allows it to roll around the shape of the housing. So we'll click play and you can see that rolling around that I was talking about. And that orange point is tracing the line that is our housing shape. Now you can see that you can also manually edit this A variable. And that's how we're going to get our points, but it doesn't quite help us yet. So we're gonna scroll down to where we see this BC point. And that's the orange point that traces your line. And we're gonna check this label box. Now we can see the X, Y coordinates of our point wherever it is in its animation. This is where things start to get a little bit tedious. So if you guys know any easier way to do this, definitely sound off in the comments, but I haven't found an easier way to insert a graph into Fusion. Setting A to zero, let's start putting our points into an Excel file. So column A is going to be your X, B your Y, and three your Z axis but z is always going to be zero because you're inserting it into a sketch plane. It does need to be there though, so be sure to keep that in mind. Now we'll need to move our bc point along that path. So to do that, we can change a to say 0.1, but we can see that's a little too far. So I used 10,000, so 0.01. That will give us a good starting point for our next point in the Excel file. Now, I doubt you wanna watch me enter all of these points into Excel. So I already have it done, but your next step would be to change A to say 0 0.02, and then enter those in your next line, and so on and so forth, until you have as much of the shape as you need. Once you have all the points you need, you're gonna go up here to File, and click Save As. And you're gonna save this not as an Excel file, so click this drop down here, and find where it says CSV. Save that wherever you wanna keep it, and then jump right into Fusion 360. I'll go ahead and save this and create a new component for our test. Now you're gonna go up on your toolbar and find the box where it says add-ins. If you click the drop down, you can go to scripts and add-ins. It'll bring up this little dialog box. Scroll down that until you see this add-in called import spline CSV. This will bring up file explorer and you need to navigate to where you saved that CSV file at. If you open that, it's going to insert it into your document as a sketch. Now I need to move this sketch into my component because it did just place it in the mother file instead of in the component that I had active. To save time, since this shape is symmetrical, I only did one fourth of it. So we're gonna draw two construction lines, one straight up along the Y axis and one straight along the X axis. Press L for line and X to turn that into a construction line. We'll just go from the origin straight up and straight to the right. Now we're gonna use the mirror tool, select our spline as our objects and the construction line we drew earlier as the mirror line. And we're gonna do the same thing one more time. The only difference being this time we're gonna select both splines and the Y axis as our mirror line. And then press enter and you have your shape. Now I'm just gonna do a quick center rectangle to give this part some body. So I'll draw that around the part. We'll do E for extrude and extrude this a quarter inch. Now we'll move on to the rotor. And this one's a lot easier because it actually just references all of the parts of the shape we just made. So we'll create a new component called rotor and we'll create a sketch on the front face of the body that we just made. Press P for project and we'll project all of the geometry across this part. 
and then press enter. Now we'll need three arcs. So I'm just going to use a three point arc and two of your arcs need to start on this left center point. So click there. It doesn't matter where your second points are because we'll fix that with constraints and then make sure all three arcs are connected. Now we need to create three construction lines across these arcs. So press L and then X for your construction line. We'll go from the point where two arcs meet to the center point of the opposite arc. So you can see it snap to that center point and those white points there. So you'll do that three times. So you have three lines going across that triangular shape. This line going across the X axis needs to be horizontal vertical. So we'll use that constraint to get the, our triangle lined up. And then we'll use the equals constraint to make all three of these lines equal in length and do the same with the arcs. So they're all the same length. So now we have the shape of our rotor. The only problem is it's not quite the right size. So we're going to make this point here coincident with the arc on the opposite side of the rotor. And we're going to make the corner point of the rotor coincident to the edge of our housing. Finally, we'll press E to extrude and extrude that one a quarter inch as well. And then you have both your rotor shape and your housing shape for your Wankel engine. That's it for this video. It was really three pretty basic parts. But this video was more about learning how to create those shapes and design our Wankel engine and figuring out how it exactly works. I realize that the fidget spinner craze is kind of over with, but if you do want to make one of these for yourself, be sure to head over to our site, NYCCNC, where you can download all the files for this part and make your very own Wankel fidget spinner. As always, I had fun. Hopefully you guys did too. Definitely keep an eye out for more Wankel content coming soon. And hey, We'll see you next week on NYC CNC.